Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. In our last Winter is Coming video, we wrapped up our analysis of the pre-released Ariane chapters as she journeyed to the Stormlands to treat with John Connington and Aegon. Today we will be continuing our Winter is Coming series with Arya, coming off her first successful faceless assassination, wearing her second face, and posing as a girl named Mercy who's working with a mummer's troop to further her training in the art of deception. So, let's do this. She woke with a gasp not knowing who she was or where. The smell of blood was heavy in her nostrils, or was that her nightmare lingering? She had dreamed of wolves again, of running through some dark pine forest with a great pack at her heels, hard on the scent of prey. Half-light filled the room, gray and gloomy. Shivering, she sat up in her bed and ran a hand across her scalp. Stubble bristled against her palm. I need to shave before Isambaro sees. Mercy. I'm Mercy. And tonight, I'll be raped and murdered. Her true name was Mercedine. But Mercy was all anyone ever called her. Except in dreams. She took a breath to quiet the howling in her heart, trying to remember more of what she'd dreamt but most of it had gone already. There had been blood in it, though, and a full moon overhead, and a tree that watched her as she ran. Okay, so let's begin our analysis by first pointing out that it would appear that Bloodraven was watching her warging into Nymeria and hunting with her pack. Now, Arya's storyline is one in which George heavily plays with the idea of lost identity which is sort of showcased in this chapter by Arya having a hard time remembering where she is or who she is when she woke up. This is particularly relevant when considering the many identities that Arya has had to use along her journey to get to this point, and the fact that the last time we saw her, the Faceless Men, having already put her through months of mind games and cleaning bodies, capitalizing on the fact that she feels like she has nowhere else to go, and that she's now come too far to turn back, placing her in the position where they could really begin putting the screws to her. In her last chapter, they gave her her first face, and a target to kill. When she succeeded, they gave her another face, and told her to go and learn the ways of the Mummers, who are obviously quite skilled at pretending to be people they are not. All of this seems geared towards systematically and completely stripping Arya of her identity having her change her identity so many times that she will actually begin to forget who Arya actually was, and in turn, become no one. But this is no simple task, as Arya has a very strong sense of self, which here seems to be represented by her struggling to, quote, quiet the howling in her heart, showing us that Arya is definitely still in there and isn't going to go quietly into the night. She had fastened the shutters back so the morning sun might wake her. But there was no sun outside the window of Mercy's little room. Only a wall of shifting gray fog. The air had grown chilly, and a good thing, else she might have slept all day. It would be just like Mercy to sleep through her own rape. Goose prickles covered her legs. Her coverlet had twisted around her like a snake. She unwound it, threw the blanket to the bare plank floor, and padded naked to the window. Bravos was lost in fog. She could see the green water of the little canal below, the cobbled stone street that ran beneath her building, two arches of the mossy bridge. But the far end of the bridge vanished in grayness, and of the buildings across the canal, only a few vague lights remained. She heard a soft splash as a serpent boat emerged beneath the bridge's central arch. What hour? 
Mercy called down to the man who stood by the snake's uplifted tail, pushing her onward with his pole. The waterman gazed up, searching for the voice. Four, by the titan's roar! His words echoed hollowly off the swirling green waters and the walls of unseen buildings. Now, the Titan of Bravos is a really interesting fortress-slash-statue. It stands about 400 feet high, which is enormous to say the least, about four times the size of the Statue of Liberty, just to give you a little perspective. It seems likely to have been inspired by the legends of the Colossus of Rhodes, a massive stone and bronze statue in ancient Greece, made to commemorate the independence of Rhodes, and as a tribute to their patron god, Helios. Helios was their sun god, and in some ancient texts, the all-seeing eye of Zeus. He would ride his chariot across the sky, bringing with him each new day. In legend, his massive statue at Rhodes straddled the entrance to their port, just like the Titan of Bravos does. It is, however, unlikely that this was actually the case, as just about every architect, archaeologist, and historian agrees that it not only would have been impractical, as it would have forced them to close their thriving port during construction, but would also be very outside the norm in terms of how ancient Greeks depicted one of their gods. Now, the fact that the Colossus of Rhodes was also a tribute to the patron god of Rhodes might also imply that the Titan of Bravos could be a tribute to the patron god of Bravos. And what is the patron god of Bravos? Well, George said that the people of Bravos created a new religion when they founded their new city, one that honored the gods of all the various places that the people came from, the many-faced god, also sometimes referred to as the faceless god, which might explain why what appeared to be the titan shadow in Bran's dream had no face when it lifted its visor. In terms of what just happened in this chapter, the people of Bravos keep the time based on the titan's roar, how exactly the Titan's roar is created seems a mystery, at least to me. How do they make such an awe-inspiring roar come out of this stone and bronze statue? I honestly have no idea. And does the Titan also roar to signify the many hours of the day as this pole boatman seems to have implied? It seems like that would be kind of confusing. How do the people of Bravos distinguish the roars that signify dawn, sunset, and the many hours of the day from the ones that warn the arsenal that a ship is approaching their harbor. I guess they could use different roars for each, but that once again brings us back to the question of how the roar is created to begin with. It's not a horn or a bell, it's a roar, as in it sounds like a living creature is making it. It also seems a bit confusing that Mercy slept until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. That seems almost impossible with the titan roaring all day, not to mention the fact that in the pre-industrialized world, people tended to rise with the sun and go to bed soon after sunset. It also seems odd that Arya had just woken from a nighttime wolf dream where she was hunting with Nymeria's pack under a full moon. Yet it is somehow almost evening in Bravos, which by my calculations can't be more than a time zone or two ahead of the Riverlands. So, how is it the middle of the night in the Riverlands and almost evening in Bravos? No idea. But there's definitely something really creepy about this city. She was not late. Not yet. But she should not dawdle. Mercy was a happy soul and a hard worker, but seldom timely. That would not serve tonight. The envoy from Westeros was expected at the gate this evening, and Isambara would be in no mood to hear excuses even if she served them up with a sweet smile. She had filled her basin from the canal last night before she went to sleep, preferring the brackish water to the slimy green rainwater stewing in the cistern out back. Dipping a rough cloth, she washed herself head to heel, standing on one leg at a time to scrub her calloused feet. After that, she found her razor, a bare scalp helped the wigs fit better, Isambaro claimed. She shaved, donned her small clothes, and slipped a shapeless brown wool dress down over her head. One of her stockings needed mending, she saw as she pulled it up. 
she would ask the snapper for help. Her own sewing was so wretched that the wardrobe mistress usually took pity on her. Else, I could filch a nicer pair from wardrobe. That was risky, though. Isambaro hated it when the mummers wore his costumes in the streets. Except for Wendane. Give Isambaro's cock a little suck and a girl can wear any costume that she wants. Mercy was not so foolish as all that. Dana had warned her. Girls who start down that road wind up on the ship, where every man in the pit knows he can have any pretty thing he might see up on this stage, if his purse is plump enough. Her boots were lumps of old brown leather, mottled with salt stains, and cracked from long wear. Her belt, a length of hempen rope, dyed blue. She knotted it about her waist and hung a knife on her right hip and a coin pouch on her left. Last of all, she threw her cloak across her shoulders. It was a real mummer's cloak, purple wool lined in red silk, with a hood to keep the rain off, and three secret pockets, too. She'd hid some coins in one of those, an iron key in another, a blade in the last. A real blade, not a fruit knife like the one on her hip, but it did not belong to Mercy, no more than her other treasures did. The fruit knife belonged to Mercy. She was made for eating fruit, for smiling and joking, for working hard and doing as she was told. Mercy, 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 she sang, as she descended the wooden stair to the street. The handrail was splintery, the steps steep, and there were five flights, but that was why she'd gotten the room so cheap. That and Mercy's smile. She might be bald and skinny, but Mercy had a pretty smile and a certain grace. Even Isambaro agreed that she was graceful. She was not far from the gate as the crow flies, but for girls with feet instead of wings, the way was longer. Bravos was a crooked city. The streets were crooked, the alleys were crookeder, and the canals were crookedest of all. Most days, she preferred to go the long way, down the Ragman's Road along the outer harbor, where she had the sea before her and the sky above and a clear view across the great lagoon to the arsenal and the pliny slopes of Seligoro's shield. Sailors would hail her as she passed the docks, calling down from the decks of Terry Ebony's whalers and big-bellied Westerosi cogs. Mercy could not always understand their words, but she knew what they were saying. Sometimes she would smile back and tell them they could find her at the gate if they had the coin. Okay, so this once again underscores an idea that we talked about in our Faceless Men series. Wearing a face seems to grant the wearer some of the person whose face they're wearing's characteristics, making it easier for the wearer to actually impersonate that person. Kind of like what Jockin does at the Citadel when he became Pate. Without some sort of magical infusion of Pate's memories and characteristics, he would never be able to impersonate Pate for such a prolonged period of time. Now, getting back to Arya, she is far from graceful. She's definitely coordinated and quick, but graceful seems more in line with Sansa, or what her mother always wished Arya could be, rather than the bull in the china shop that Arya actually was. Yet, here she is, wearing Mercy's face, and she's not only pretty enough to attract the attention of all the sailors that she walks past, in spite of the fact that she's really only ten years old and bald, but also thought of as graceful by the owner and operator of the theater that she's currently working in, who, by definition, should be the type that would know gracefulness when he saw it. The long way also took her across the Bridge of Eyes with its carved stone faces. From the top of its span, she could look through the arches and see all the city. The green copper domes of the Hall of Truth. The masts rising like a forest from the purple harbor. The tall towers of the mighty. The golden thunderbolt turning on its spire atop the Sea Lord's palace. 
even the titan's bronze shoulders, off across the dark green waters. But that was only when the sun was shining down on Bravos. If the fog was thick, there was nothing to see but gray. So today, Mercy chose the shorter route to save some wear on her poor, cracked boots. The mists seemed to part before her and close up again as she passed. The cobblestones were wet and slick under her feet. She heard a cat yowl plaintively. Bravos was a good city for cats, and they roamed everywhere, especially at night. In the fog, all cats are gray, Mercy thought. In the fog, all men are killers. She had never seen a thicker fog than this one. On the larger canals, the watermen would be running their serpent boats into one another, unable to make out any more than dim lights from the buildings to either side of them. Mercy passed an old man with a lantern walking the other way, and envied him his light. The street was so gloomy she could scarcely see where she was stepping. In the humbler parts of the city, the houses, shops, and warehouses crowded together, leaning on each other like drunken lovers. Their upper stories so close you could step from one balcony to the next. The streets below became dark tunnels where every footfall echoed. The small canals were even more hazardous, since many of the houses that lined them had privies jutting out over the water. Isimbaro loved to give the Sea Lord speech from the merchant's melancholy daughter about how here the last titan yet stands, astride the stony shoulders of his brothers. But Mercy preferred the scene where the fat merchant shat on the Sea Lord's head as he passed underneath in his gold and purple barge. Only in Bravos could something like that happen, it was said, and only in Bravos would Sea Lord and Sailor alike howl with laughter to see it. This seems as good a time as any to point out that the Titan is said on more than one occasion to be standing on his brothers. So what is the Titan standing on? Sea mounts. And what is a sea mount? A seamount is an underwater mountain formed by volcanic activity, and are often classified as dormant volcanoes, which appears to give the Titans some sort of relation to volcanic activity. This took us down the path of looking at volcanic gods from mythology, where we found that the Greeks and Romans each had one, of which we're going to choose to talk about the Roman version, because I can pronounce his name. Vulcan from which the word volcano is derived, was also the smith of the gods, and the god of fire, which could also explain the titan's fiery eyes. He was also married to the goddess of love and beauty, Venus, who tended to cheat on him. He wasn't a very good-looking guy. When she cheated, he would get so angry that he'd go into his forge and hammer on whatever he was making at the time so hard that it would cause volcanoes to erupt. Hmm, that sounds a little bit like the Doom of Valyria, doesn't it? And when combined with the fact that the eruptions were caused by an ancient-slash-old god's hammer, it kind of makes one think of the Hammer of the Waters. But let's get back to the Titan of Bravo standing on two volcanoes that are said to be his brothers, and why it seems important to our story. Well, we know that the children unsuccessfully attempted to use the Hammer of the Waters at Mo Kalin. And we also know from both Theon and Catelyn that Mo Kalin is made of and littered with huge blocks of basalt. Basalt forms when lava reaches the Earth's surface at a volcano or a mid-ocean bridge, which seems to suggest that although a second breaking was unsuccessful, it got close enough to allow lava to reach the surface and form large deposits of volcanic basalt. Now, the sea mounts the Titan of Bravos is standing on are said to be made of black granite, which forms from the slow crystallization of magma below the Earth's surface, which means it's also created by volcanic activity, which might also explain why Winterfell is made of black granite, as it seems relatively clear that the hot springs in Winterfell's godswood are heated by volcanic activity, which is likely the source of the granite used to build the castle. When looking at all of this together, it lends further credence to the idea that the Hammer of the Waters was once successfully executed in Bravos. It might also indicate 
that the Titan is some sort of symbolic embodiment of the Bravosi's final victory over the Valyrians, the victory through which they gave the many-faced gods gift to every man, woman, child, and dragon living in the lands of the long summer. The gate stood by the edge of the drowned town, between the outer harbor and the purple harbor. An old warehouse had burnt there, and the ground was sinking a little more each year, so the land came cheap. Atop the flooded stone foundation of the warehouse, Isambaro raised his cavernous play hall. The dome in the blue lantern might enjoy more fashionable environs, he told his mummers, but here, between the harbors, they would never lack for sailors and whores to fill their pit. The ship was close by, still pulling handsome crowds to the quay, where she had been moored for twenty years, he said, and the gate would flourish too. Time had proved him right. The gate's stage had developed a tilt as the building settled. Their costumes were prone to mildew, and water snakes nested in their flooded cellar. But none of that troubled the mummers, so long as the house was full. The last bridge was made of rope and raw planks, and seemed to dissolve into nothingness. But that was only the fog. Mercy scampered across, her heels ringing on the wood. The fog opened before her like a tattered gray curtain to reveal the playhouse. Buttery yellow light spilled from the doors, and Mercy could hear voices from within. Beside the entrance, Big Brusco had painted over the title of the last show and written The Bloody Hand in its place in huge red letters. He was painting a bloody hand beneath the words for those who could not read. Mercy stopped to have a look. That's a nice hand, she told him. Thumbs crooked. Briscoe dabbed at it with his brush. King of the Mummers been asking after you. It was so dark I slept and slept. When Isambaro had first dubbed himself the King of the Mummers, the company had taken a wicked pleasure in it savoring the outrage of their rivals from the dome in the blue lantern. Of late, though, Isambaro had begun to take his title too seriously. He will only play kings now, Morrow said, rolling his eyes. And if the play has no king in it, he would sooner not stage it at all. The bloody hand offered two kings, the fat one and the boy. Isambaro would play the fat one. It was not a large part, but he had a fine speech as he lay dying, and a splendid fight with a demonic boar before that. Ferio Pharrell had written it, and he had the bloodiest quill in all of Bravos. Okay, so in this last part, we get a very vivid description of what the weather's like in Bravos. In a previous chapter, Arya notes that Bravos only has three types of weather in autumn. Fog was bad, rain was worse, freezing rain was worst. This just so happens to be the thickest fog that Arya has ever seen, which also seems symbolic of the state that Arya is currently in, nearly blind to what's going on around her. The faceless men are lying to her and trying as hard as they can to strip her of her identity and turn her into no one, so they can use her for their own purposes. The terrible weather in Bravos also seems in line with one of the oldest and most common symbolic literary tools. Weather has been used to symbolize or foreshadow events to come in literature seemingly since literature existed. George's writing is no exception. His use of rain and storms tends to foreshadow dark events to come. For instance, it was pouring when Rob arrived at the Twins just prior to the Red Wedding. Rain, or in this case fog, also seems tied to water symbolic representation of the yin aspect of the story, which, as we discussed in our What is the Song of Ice and Fire video, seems tied to the death and darkness half of the Manichaean War to come. Coming up in Part 2, we will be picking up with Arya's struggle to maintain her identity 
as the Mummers make preparations to put on the Bloody Hand, written by Ferio Farrell, who seems likely to be related to Sirio in some way, which appears to be a depiction of the final days of Robert's reign, and the earliest days of the reign of the noblest child the gods ever put on this good earth.